Welcome to Travels Through Time, the podcast made in partnership with Unseen Histories. I'm Peter Moore. Today we're going back to the desperate days of the First World War for our Remembrance Day special. We often think of the armistice of November 1918 as signalling the end of a terrible period of suffering. But for many families, the cessation of hostilities did not mean the end of the story. At the war's end, the whereabouts of more than half a million British soldiers alone was unknown. These were people from all walks of life, often people who were very young, people who had simply vanished into the battlefields. The question of how to deal with such an absence, absence of a person, of an explanation, haunted the nation. In his book, The Searchers, The Quest for the Lost of the First World War, Robert Sackville West takes us back to this complicated history, and he shows us how people tried to make sense of things in their own distinctive ways. I spoke to Robert just the other day. Robert Sackville West, a warm welcome to the podcast. Um, We're going to be talking about your book The Searchers today and we're going to be going um, on an adventure back to 1915 to pull out, draw out some of the themes that you write about in the book. But I thought it would be quite useful if I started today's conversation by reading an extract of a letter which you include in the book, and it's a letter which is addressed to the family of Private H. Dean of the East Surrey Regiment, dated the 5th of March 1920. It reads, Notwithstanding constant and careful inquiries, we have never succeeded in telling you anything about your son. His name was on our lists for months, and we asked all of the men in his unit whom we were able to see both in English hospitals and at the bases abroad, but none of them threw any light on his casualty. We have also questioned released prisoners, but have learned nothing. We can therefore only send you a general account of the action in which he was last seen, with sincere regret at our inability to help you any further, as this office is now closed. We wish at the same time to offer our sympathy to your family and friends. My question after reading that quite moving letter is how representative is this of wider communications that were going out around the time of this, which is 1920? What what broader history does it speak of? In the immediate aftermath of the First World War, there was still something like half a million soldiers, servicemen, whose bodies were unaccounted for. So their families had been in this complete limbo of uncertainty ever since they had disappeared, missing in action from 1914 through to even as in the case of the letter you um, uh, read, uh, still not knowing what happened in 1920. So this is a half a million servicemen and goodness knows how many more actual relatives were personally distressed by this lack of of certainty. The the letter you read, I think, must have been um, sent by a so-called searcher from the Wounded and Missing Inquiry Department of the Red Cross. And they responded, wrote uh, something in the region of 400,000 such letters over the course of the war and its immediate aftermath in similar terms after making exhaustive inquiries into what might have happened to these uh, poor servicemen. And uh, H. Dean's uh, predicament and the predicament of his family is by no means unique, but always heartbreaking. Absolutely. The numbers you mention are just astonishing. When you um, stated there half a million people but we can 
look at this in all sorts of different ways. I mean, there's one point where you say the bodies of two thirds of the New Zealand soldiers killed at Gallipoli were never recovered. And I think this is almost an underappreciated fact of the First World War, because we, I suppose, have ironed out the story in our minds. And it seems, or or we suppose at least, that um, the history stands in in quite neat lists on on, on the war memorials in the villages across the country. And, and further beyond in the, in the cemeteries in France and, and so on. But that's really only part of the story, isn't it? It is. We're all, or many of us, are familiar with those sort of hauntingly beautiful military cemeteries on the Western Front, uh, where most of the uh, soldiers are identified by name. Although something like 180,000, you will see um, a headstone which reads, something like um, soldier of the great war unknown um, to God. And that particular uh, soldier, his body would have been buried, but nobody had any, he was probably so blasted to pieces that nobody had any idea who um, he might have been. But there are also these uh, great uh, memorial walls um, for example, um, in Ypres, the Men in Gate, or on the Somme at Tiepval, where just lists of all the soldiers who are known to have gone missing, whose bodies were never recovered, and really nothing is known a- a- about them apart from the fact of their death. It, it kind of speaks to, I suppose, a part of humanity which transcends the story. We We just need to know, don't we? There's a really strong impulse within us to know what happened. And you can see that in different theatres of history or in different incidents, like when an aircraft might go missing or when there's a missing person. But there's a particular acuteness to this, I think. And I wanted to ask you, really, if there was any prompt which drove you to this story, was there a was there a moment when you thought, hang on, this is underrepresented, I want to get into it? Um, what set you off on the trail? Well, I first got interested in this whole um, area, or in fact, I mean, an area as broad as the impact of the First World War in, you know, 2014, like many other people, you know, the centenary of the outbreak of the First World War. And I remember, you know, being very struck by the sight of that installation of 800,000 ceramic poppies that um, were were, were positioned around the uh, moat of the Tower of London, and it was a you know beautiful and moving sight. And now those eight hundred thousand poppies represented the dead. But I then read somewhere that actually half that number, or more than half that number, were never recovered. And I think it was just that simple fact of the scale of the missing that I found you know terrible. And I then got drawn into finding out more and more about you know how how did society or how did families cope with this how did society cope with this how did the state cope with this that i got drawn into the the whole f- field area of the searchers now the searchers might be the families looking for the bodies or even souls of their lost ones or they may be professional searchers employed by the red cross trying to find out information um, such as the information provided in the letter you read yeah and these i think there's one thing as well which i have to mention because it really came across strongly to me quite aside from the violence of the period and the trauma that it inflicted on later generations and and the utter you know kind of awfulness of the first world war if we leave that if as much as we can to one side for a moment It's a fascinating period in our past to look at anyway because of the, I I suppose it's a great era of letter writing. It's a wonderful era of prose style. You have a great amount of surviving material, not just from, um, I, I suppose, personal correspondence between different people, but from the newspapers, which were also going through, this is a great, period for journalism and you you quote Northcliffe who was writing at this time as well and I suppose this dovetails also with 
this period of detective mania, which is seen with the, the Sherlock Holmes novels. Conan Doyle was a great figure at this time. And um, I suppose it, there's the picture of you, which is kind of an interesting thing for me reading the book, being a detective today of a story when people were being detectives themselves a hundred years ago. Did you get that sense? Do you know what I I'm getting I think I do. And um, there were certain avenues of inquiry for example, that uh, were were sort of satisfying as I wrote the book. You talked about uh, Lord um, Northcliffe, who is a newspaper uh, proprietor who wrote a book called At the War, which was a sort of celebration of all the great work that was being done, uh, particularly by... um, volunteer and uh, citizens as opposed to to, in in addition to the soldiers and he quotes one of the letters such as the one that you read earlier he wrote uh, one of the correspondences about the um, uh, tracking down and location of an airman who'd gone uh, missing and he's tracked down through um, uh, interviews and a certain amount of detective uh, work to a hospital in um, in Bombay, and uh, he quotes this correspondence and story in his book. And then it turns out that one of the searchers, no, the searcher who actually uh, conducted the interviews and wrote the report that resulted in this airman's discovery, was the great novelist E. M. Forster, who happened to be at that time a searcher in Alexandria, Egypt. So were these little uh, connections that somehow drew this whole field together and I found that uh, fascinating. It's a testament isn't it to our like absolute desire to know to, to have the final answer even when things are as distant we're now beyond the centenary aren't we we're we're into um, you know kind of time beyond that but still the work goes on as you say. Well, what we're going to do today, I think it should be really interesting, is to look at a few different examples of this of this, uh, this theatre of history and this particular question of the missing and the idea of the searchers. And we'll begin it with me asking you um, a question which I think is a little bit misleading today because what I usually say to people is if you could travel back through time which year would you like to visit and maybe I'll rephrase Thank that you. slightly today because there's <laughs> it's a it's a bit of a um, you know there's a, there's a different feel to today's episode but which year are you going to take us back to to have a look at can you tell us which one you've chosen please? I've chosen the year 1915 and I've chosen that year because I think that, you know, the war um, started in 1914, but by 1915, the sheer scale and difference of this war had become apparent uh, to everybody. So it was the first time that the sort of psychological impact of the First World War was an everyday phenomenon. So it's a, it's a fascinating uh, year in many ways, because people were for the first time, not just on the battlefield, but on the home front, adapting to a uh, set of circumstances. It was completely new. The effect on individuals and their relatives uh, was something that they had never encountered on this scale before. I wanted to ask you a broad question about 1915, because I think if you speak to most people about the First World War, they have this sense of... Um, 1914 being a time when there was tremendous pent-up forces in Europe. There was this collision that was coming and there was a great deal of enthusiasm for the conflict. And there was this famous idea that it was all going to be over by Christmas. That's what everyone uh, seemed to believe. I'm not sure if that's historical fact or how it's been reported to us now. But should we think of 1915 as, as that kind of early optimism has been destroyed by the miserable reality of what's happening um, everywhere. I think that's that's true, and nowhere is that truer uh, than in the um, numbers of um, uh, the printed casualty lists that appeared in the newspapers, the number of families who were receiving either letters or telegrams from the Ministry of War to say that um, uh, that their loved ones were missing or indeed dead. And it, it, I think that it was the realisation 
something on a scale that hadn't existed before. And one of the things that was very different was that whereas all previous wars in, um, uh, in which Britain had been involved were fought on the whole by um, regular professional armies, at the start of the First World War, Britain had an army of 300,000 uh, soldiers. Over the next four years, five million men would be deployed on the Western Front at some time or other, with, you know, at uh, times two million soldiers actually on the front. So the scale of involvement is massive. And these were not professional soldiers. These were citizen soldiers, and therefore their families and the state had a different expectation in a way about how they should be uh, treated um, in life and certainly in death. Yeah, and as you say, it would be um, by this point, and with that number of people, surely something that was touching every family in the country in some way. Or other. Okay, well, let's go into a bit more close-up history. Um, where should we go to first? Could you give me um, the date and place of your first scene, and then we'll go and examine it? I think that the first um, uh, thing I want to, or person I want to, to look at is Rudyard Kipling and his wife, Carrie, who uh, receive, they're at home in Sussex at um, their house Bateman's, on the 2nd of October 1915, when they receive a, a telegram to tell them that their son, uh, John, has um, gone missing. He's gone missing at the Battle of Luz um, uh, in uh, northern France. And they are obviously distraught. Turns out that, that, that he had gone missing um, in fact, on the 27th of September. So actually they heard relatively quickly for those times within about five days. Could I Could I just, at this point, just fill in a bit of context? Because Kipling is a name that everyone will probably be familiar with. But in this point, in, in 1915, where are we in his career? What kind of... Is he... Is he the Kipling of legend already? Is he the Nobel Prize winning um, character that, that we remember? He is all those things. He's an absolute titan of literature. He's, an, he's Britain's only, um, uh, at that stage, uh, first um, uh, Nobel Prize winner for uh, literature. He's uh, immensely uh, popular. He... Um, uh, and popular is 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 a, is a good word because he is he's a popular he's a populist, and in some ways he represents what a lot of people feel or think they feel about Britain. So he's um, uh, uh, an immense figure. He's a great uh, patriot, and there is a terrible irony in a way in that his son John, who has just gone missing, um, had actually failed his army uh, uh, medicals because of his extreme uh, poor sight. And it was only due to the father, Rudyard Kipling's uh, string pulling, that his son got a commission uh, in the Irish Guards, which may be seen as his uh, death sentence. So there is that that irony um, at the heart of that particular uh, story. He was eighteen years old, wasn't he, John? I he was. Right. I mean, at the time that he actually managed to get his um, enlisted, he was only seventeen, and he had to wait impatiently, but wait he had to before he was actually uh, sent out to France in the uh, uh, late summer of. Um, 1915. I mean, he was only on the Western Front for a few weeks. Did Do we know, because obviously we know a lot about his father, because his father's such a great figure. Do we know much about him and his own biography? I remember, um, well, I remember, I read it in your book the other day, that he was, um, he was, you know, kind of born and his father had decided that he was going to be brought up to be in the Navy and he was very proud of him. And he writes these very fatherly letters about how he's going to raise him up like a kind of, you know, kind of prize vegetable or something like this to be a great member of the you know, kind of the British military. Um, do we know anything about him, though? Does he, apart from he was uh, short-sighted? We know, course, uh, no, and he, anything was, more? he was very, it, it was, um, um, he and his father had a very good, close, and mother, it was a close affection uh, family. 
Um, the father was, you know, very, very proud of the son. The son was very um, adoring of his parents. He was a young uh, man and he, he wrote letters um, uh, to his parents from the front and they're full of a sort of that, that breezy, cheerful um, uh, 1915 optimism. Uh, uh, without um, really letting on to how, you know, terrible it uh, must ha have uh, been. Uh, but as Kipling later wrote, you know, he was almost, as indeed were all his um, comrades, they were almost children. You know, that's, th that's the, 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 the terrible thing. And the one thing which makes this desperately, desperately difficult for, Ki for Kipling to contend with is the fact that there is nobody um, and the circumstances of what actually happened are very, very elusive. Can you tell us a little bit about what what he knew at that time, maybe in the first few days after the initial reports? Well, almost immediately after he'd received this telegram on the 2nd of October saying that um, his son was missing, and missing is it was, the, was the key word, because if you were reported missing, you immediately, the parent assumed that they were alive, even if the, a lot of the sort of indications were to the contrary. So he pulls every string to try and find out more. He um, uh, has his uh, friends write to the Prince of Wales, to the ambassadors of neutral countries. He starts to interview um, uh, the soldiers. He goes out to France. And he carries on um, uh, trying to prove, against all the evidence, that his son is possibly alive for the next four years. He even, at one stage, um, commissions the uh, Royal Flying Corps to um, um, airdrop um, uh, leaflets over uh, behind German lines, um, asking, you know, has anyone seen this soldier? It takes him four years. It takes him and his wife four years until 1919, until they at least accept the fact that he's dead. Mm, got the text here, um, again included in your book, um, which he is, is from a letter that Kipling writes to Walter Page, who's the American ambassador at the time. And um, I don't know why I found this quite so sad. Maybe it's in, in the sense that you can see a great writer striving for clarity in his description of his son because um i know he was he was worried because when his his son goes missing he's not got his identity uh, kind of disc thing attached so he writes this letter and he says um he's dark with a strongly marked uh, with strongly marked eyebrows small mustache thick brown hair straight in in uh, brackets dark brown eyes with long lashes height about five foot seven and a half inches small white scar on his forehead and one front tooth slightly discolored he's short-sighted and is most probably wearing gold spectacles he wears a small gold signet ring with monogram jk all his clothes are marked i mean that's that's straight from you know our kind of nobel prize winning um, author trying to describe his son in terms which were so specific that that some identification might be made of a fragment of a tooth of a you know so I, I found that in, incredibly moving. Was he in a state of complete denial, or was the reason to believe that he might be alive? Is if you look at this at a distance, um, what do you think? If you look at these things from a distance, and you know from a distance with hindsight what the state of those battles were you will you you might say that they were uh, many of the characters in my book including roger kipling in a state of denial but as for all of them and this is a sort of common theme that runs through the book is that where there was any vestige of of hope families would cling on to it just as john kipling does and many, many other families, you know, they will believe hope against hope that their son or whatever it is, a, is a prisoner, is wounded, languishing in a hospital somewhere. Um, they'll believe anything apart from the fact that he is dead until they can't hope 
for that delusion, as it were, any longer. And this is, I suppose, bound up with the idea that it seems to be something of a betrayal to the memory of someone who's gone if you give up hope. Is, uh, that's no, rough, that is isn't? definitely true. I think lots of people thought exactly that, that when they gave up hope, um, they would actually be betraying the memory. Mm. There's something else that's interesting um, about this story, which happens um, a little bit later on, uh, I wanted to ask you about. And he, this is when, um, I think it's his, maybe as late as 1917, when a few more details of the battle come to light and maybe some eyewitness accounts of um, of his last moments. And uh, obviously the, the question is, why... Why did you not say this before? Why have you left it two years? And the um, the soldier who in, in question says, NCOs and men hardly ever discuss any events in France when they get back here. It's an extraordinary thing, but it is so. So that's a very, very early indication of what we now talk about as shell shock or maybe um, PTSD or this maybe something more subtle than that, just not talking about the past because it's too traumatic to engage with. So I suppose for people like Kipling, who are at the start of this process, they might be thinking that someone knows something's going to come out, but no one's talking about that. Is that that is, is that absolutely right? true? And the other thing that people, um, that soldiers did um, on their return, um, and, and lots of them who say didn't talk about it at all, but sometimes they would they would uh, fashion the facts in order to give hope to the questioners, um, to the families. So they would actually help the families to continue in their uh, delusion because they didn't want to upset the families by telling them the truth. So one of the things that professional searchers had to do the whole time was to get to the bottom of this and to work out, am I being told the actual truth? Is it um, corroborated? Uh, is it cross-checked? Or is it because this piece of information is uh, designed to console, to soften the blow. Yeah, and absolutely. And, oh God, we're deep into the moral thickets here. Oh, but there's this kind of question if you, and I'm sure you, you can say something on this as well, this idea that if people do know the truth of what happened, how fair is it to relay the kind of grisly detail to the family, which they then have to bear the burden of knowing? That's another problem, isn't it? There was a debate about this at the time, and particularly um, in the wording of the letters sent by the um, Wounded and Missing Inquiry Department, should they be euphemistic in their description of the death or should they tell the truth? And I think the consensus in the end was they probably should tell and the families probably wanted uh, the truth because uh, people can, can spot a euphemism um, uh, and they would probably, however distressing, want to know they want to know the facts they want to know how they died uh whether they suffered um and i think that the the the, the, the actual facts helped the families begin to accept the reality of the death and that was the beginning then of a process that might eventually um, um get them um um uh, through this i mean years uh, later. So I think people wanted yeah. to know the horrible details, or many people did, um, mm. uh, because they believed mm. that was the truth. So, so interesting to consider that. Could we just talk about how this story went forward? So you say it was four years before Kipling really begins to come to terms. If even that's an adequate mm. um, formulation of language, I don't know. But it's obviously he's um, he he won't accept um, the proposal of having his, his son's like kind of death put in the papers and things like that. He will not, he will not countenance that. Well, in 1919, Rudyard accepts the, the fact of his son's death and he then spends the next, um, best part of next two decades annually scarring the battlefields to locate his son's grave. And he goes on sort of annual pilgrimages, as many people did after the war, to the uh, cemeteries as they evolved in on the Western Front in search of 
uh, John's grave. He even is commissioned to write the regimental history of the Irish Guards, which involves interviewing more and more soldiers. So he really builds up a picture about what might have uh, happened in particular, but he never finds the, the grave, although he often visits the um, uh, cemetery, St Mary's Cemetery, uh, where his son, unknown to him, is buried as an identified lieutenant of the Irish Guards, but he never finds John's grave, which is a great irony for Kipling, who is the man who basically drafted the phrase, their name liveth forevermore. So the, the man who provides all the um, sort of um, uh, phrases that we associate with commemoration uh, never has himself a place where he can lay his own grief. And he dies in 1936, Kipling, uh, Kipling still um, uh, ignorant of where John um, was buried. Almost 60 years later in 1992, as a result of sort of some of the detective work that we were talking about earlier, a uh, researcher at the Commonwealth War Graves uh, Commission believes that this grave, um, attributed to an unknown soldier of the um, uh, uh, Lieutenant of the Irish Guards, is in fact the grave of John uh, Kipling. And after a lot of uh, discussion, argument, it is decided and accepted that this is John's grave and the headstone is changed from unknown uh, lieutenant in the Irish Guards to the grave of um, John Kipling, Lieutenant John Kipling. So where can we find this grave today, just for reference? It is in uh, St Mary's uh, Cemetery in, in northern France, and he had been commemorated up until that moment, John Kipling, on a, on a memorial wall to the missing, the loose, uh, as it was called, where, where the battle he'd um, fought at, the loose memorial wall uh, to the missing in Dud Corner Cemetery, again in, in northern France. And so his name had to be removed from the memorial um, to the missing, because he was no longer missing, as his headstone um, was, a new headstone was placed upon this grave. So eventually, uh, John Kipling, you know, uh, Rudyard Kipling's quest was, as it were, fulfilled sort of almost 60 years after his death. Absolutely fascinating story. One last point I just want to pick up on this um, before we move on, because we have to move on, but it, it had a big creative impact on him as a writer, didn't it? And if we if we can measure it in those terms, in your descriptions of the post-war Kipling, he seems a kind of gaunt figure, kind of worn out by life, a little bit haunted. And when he's called forward to make speeches, for example, at commemoration events, he he finds it very difficult to be able to do that. But if, um, I don't know how much of a benchmark his creative output would actually be, but if you look after the war, he's not quite the same figure as as before. Is that correct? He, he spends five and a half years between 1917 and uh, 1923 writing a two-volume history of the Irish Guards in incredible detail about um, what they did during the Great War. His, his, his focus is very uh, um, uh, minute, very uh, intense, and no, as we were describing him earlier, this sort of titan of literature is no long. He's he is in many ways a broken man. Hmm. We'll leave that and we'll carry on because we've got so much more to get to. And um, I'm going to ask you now where you would like to go to next. We're back in 1915 again, and uh, that's going to be our starting point for this new new historical thread. Well, I mean, this one there is a there is a, a unifying thread um, in that whereas. Rudyard Kipling um, scoured the battlefields of northern France for the body, in some form or other, of his son John. Uh, Sir Oliver Lodge turned to the spirit world. On the morning of the 15th of September 1915, Oliver Lodge was uh, playing golf in Galen uh, in um, uh, Fife. And he was playing extremely badly, um, so badly uh, that he he was depressed and he had to give up after um, uh, seven holes and he 
couldn't work out what was wrong. And it was only retrospectively that he wondered whether this was some sort of eerie premonition of his um, son Raymond's uh, death in action in uh, Belgium, because it transpired, he received, or the lodges received two days later, the standard issue telegram from the war office in London, telling them that um, Raymond had been killed, and he had been killed on the 15th of September, around the same time as his father's terribly bad round of golf. So Oliver had always been interested in what he called psychical research. He, he, He was interested in the spirit world, but this really accelerated his uh, personal transition from scientist. He was a very, very eminent scientist to a spiritualist. And within a week, his wife and then he uh, were um, consulting uh, mediums uh, in order for them to put um, the lodge parents in, in, in contact with their son, Raymond. So is this, to interpret what you're saying, is this like almost a genesis moment for him when he is on the golf course and he experiences, I don't know, this discontent, plays really badly, and later he comes to associate that with with his son's death very strongly? And is that the moment when he he maybe uh, transforms is maybe a strong word, but you you describe Sir Oliver Lodge here as he's an eminent physicist. He's the founding principal of Birmingham University. Um, He doesn't sound like the kind of person, to be honest, to get interested in the spiritual world. He's like physicists tend to stick to matter and, um, you know, good solid stuff. I mean, that he's going into the spiritual realm is quite strange. Is it something that that spun on that day on the 15th of September or is it tricky to say? I think he'd always been interested in spiritualism. I mean, for for the previous two decades, he'd taken a great interest because even though to us it seems extraordinary that this rational scientist should be drawn into this world. So... Oliver was, his speciality was uh, wireless telegraphy, electromagnetic waves. And, you know, he was, um, in some ways, he was head of Marconi. He sold his tuning patent to, to Marconi. But he believed that there was this uh, thing, which lots of late uh, 19th century people believed, that there was a thing called ether, which was sort of cosmic glue binding the universe together. And through this ether traveled electromagnetic waves, but also waves of thought, uh, feeling, and spirit. So in fact, his argument you was sort of that you could as you would later be able to tune into a radio broadcast, you could tune into the spirit world. And it all sounds rather far-fetched now, but he absolutely believed this, as did many um, uh, of his contemporaries, as a sort of scientific proposition. And when he's heard about his son's death and the moment even before, the two days before he'd actually heard, uh, you know, this sort of possibly telepathic um, uh, event, um, this really sort of propelled him wholeheartedly into the spiritualist world. So there's a few differences with the Kipling story. Does Is it, so it's not a question of him coming to or accepting the, the reality of Raymond's death. He He does that. He He just wants to communicate with him in a way which he feels that he is able to do and which hasn't been established by science yet, but which is is a possibility. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah, no, um, uh, that's the key. He he, he, he never argues uh, or is in denial about the death. Now, this is partly in Sir Oliver's case because he believed in, as it were, the con- a, a continual existence between life and death. There was no, as it were, impassable barrier. It was a seamless transition for everyone from one to the other. So there was no um, need really to deny death because he, we were all on this journey from life 
into death. And we continue to develop as Raymond, he uh, claimed, did after uh, death. So how do you make sense of this as a historian a hundred years on, looking back at this particular episode? There's something more going on here than just this anecdote, isn't there? There's, there's a broader um, historical story because spiritualism at this time was in vogue, wasn't it? It was massively in vogue. Uh, it had been in vogue up to a point in the late 19th century, but the First World War, you know, people really got interested in you know, Ouija boards, table turning mediums they all became you know uh, very popular and whatever you may think about whether this was uh, reasonable or whether it was you know fairly deranged uh, behavior it seems to me is not completely relevant because actually what it was illustrating was the extent extent to which people would go to get some form of consolation, some form of um, solace. And if the, if the church wasn't providing that particularly well for them at that time, why not um, spiritualism? And I think one of the things that is clear is that for many of these people, however deluded we may think they were, many of them actually got comfort from these beliefs that their loved ones were still alive. I mean, to, uh, because there was no um, uh, death, they were alive in an afterlife. And more importantly, they were happy because they communicated with them. And one of the things that we talked about Arthur Conan Doyle uh, earlier, who was another spiritualist, he lost his son Kingsley in 1918, and he contacts Kingsley the following year, 1919, through a medium. And Kingsley says in this particular session to uh, his father, Arthur Conan Doyle, I am so happy. And that is what these uh, parents and uh, wives and, uh, wanted to know, that their loved ones were no longer in pain, that they were happy. Does um, Oliver Lodge write about, the, is there a book about his experiences? Um, where did you research his story? Because it sounds so interesting. Well, he wrote a, a sort of su a surprise bestseller called <laughs> Raymond, All Life and Death. It goes to six editions. It's very, very popular. And it's sort of, it, it, it's divided into sort of three sections. First section is about Raymond going off to war and the types of letter he'll write from the front thanking his parents for sending him out kippers to uh, to Belgium uh, then there is the the death the second section is a is a sort of verbatim almost accounts of the sessions that Sir Oliver and his wife have with mediums and in particular a woman called uh, Gladys Osborne Leonard in her maid of ale apartment and you know the contact they have with Raymond through the medium and then the third section is about the spirit world, about this place called, called Summerland, which is this sort of paradise. It's a bit like Paris. I mean, they still have whiskey and soda and cigars there. Um, it's a kind of Edwardian paradise. paradise. Yes, somebody, so some people at the time thought it was a bit like, described um, the spiritualist Summerland as like Hampstead Garden suburb. But it is a <laughs> sort of a pastoral, sort of pastoral paradise. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's what he, he writes about. And it's a, it's, it's a bestseller. And it gave comfort, as he hoped it would, to uh, thousands of fellow bereaved uh, parents. It's uh, so interesting that you describe this particular story. A few weeks ago, I was speaking to the archaeologist Neil Oliver about um, Skara Bray, which is um, a Neolithic settlement, I don't know if you know, up on the Orkney Islands. And he was talking about that back in two and a half thousand years before Christ. So he had this um, kind of insight into how the settlement lived there. And one thing that was particularly striking to him was how when people died, they would bring the bodies back and they'd put them in the house. And he said it was a way of communing with death because now we live in an age where, um, you know, kind of death has become invisible. People just, just vanish and we have to deal with that in our own way. But I suppose there must have been something particularly brutal about it during the First World War when people vanished and there wasn't even a story to attach to their ending. We, could, we didn't even have the solace of that. So in a way, you can see this idea of the spiritual world being quite similar to bringing the bodies back, having them around you, having them close so you can 
converse with them. And so even between this, you know, kind of early 20th century society and the Neolithic one up in Scarabray, you can see these same kind of human impulses at work, even though they're having very different expressions. Do you think that's I th- right? I think that's right. And I think that it's, you know, one of, it's one of the um, uh, factors behind the popularity, for example, of pilgrimages to the battlefields after the First World War, there had been a ban on the repatriation of bodies. So there was no question of the bodies coming back to Britain. But people went out uh, to France, Belgium, even to Gallipoli, and would often bring back from there a tracing of the of, of the name on the headstone, a flower from the grave, even sometimes a piece of barbed wire um, scattered around these little uh, mementos of their loved ones to bring back into the home. Hello, it's Artemis. For some time, we've been working with the visual historian Jordan Lloyd, and we've been telling you about his fascinating colorization work. Well, recently, Jordan has launched his new project. It's a website called Unseen Histories, which showcases a broad range of fascinating historical material. You can read feature-length pieces there about female fashion in the Victorian era, or beautifully illustrated extracts from books like Susan Denham Wade's A History of Seeing. For those of you who have enjoyed Jordan's colorization work in the past, there's a full range of remastered photographs from the archives of the Library of Congress. It's history for our times. Do have a look for yourself at unseenhistories.com. That's really, really interesting. Well, let's go on. We've got one more to go, and um, we're going to meet someone very, very interesting here, one of the searches. What's your third scene, please? Well, my third scene, November uh, 1915, and the uh, novelist E.M. Forster has just arrived in uh, Alexandria, Egypt, as a Red Cross searcher. Um, He might have gone to um, uh, join an ambulance crew in uh, northern Italy. He might have gone to Malta, where his mother, domineering mother, wanted him to to go because it would be um, safe and warm. But in the end, he chose um, and was selected to go to Alexandria as a searcher. And it is a very interesting city for him. The next four years are for Forster very, very important as a turning point in his life. He goes out there age 36. He's got four novels behind him, but he's blocked. He he can't um, write. He's stuck with passage um, to India. Uh, In his private life, he's sort of stifled. He's sort of torn between his mother in the sort of suburban Weybridge and the sort of closeted world of Cambridge. And Alexandria is therefore for him a completely different uh, environment where he makes himself, in a way, a new life. So there are two interesting sort of, for me, uh, dimensions to his time there. One is his experience as a professional searcher, what he does day by day. And the other is what impact that has and his experience in Alexandria has on his own uh, life. You brought some really heavyweight writers along for us today. We've had Kipling and now we've got Forster. That's pretty good. I mean, and uh, I should also add a third because you've got Virginia Woolf giving a description, a very nice description of Forster, which is she said he was as timid as a mouse, but when he creeps out of his hole, he's very charming. Could you tell us? I mean, he was at this point um, still rather young, but he was quite eminent in the literary world. As you say, he's written. Four four books, and then they're four pretty good ones as well, where Angels Fear to Tread the Longest Journey, A Room with a View, and Howard's End. But yeah, those are behind him. He's a, he's a bit stuck, as you say. But it seems to me that he gets... Um, maybe the point of this, of going there to see him at this point, is that he seems to be very fulfilled in this role as a searcher because he feels useful. Is that, is that yeah. right? I mean, he, 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 in some aspects, he, he finds himself. And on a personal level, he, he does all these new things. He learns how to swim. He uh, visits a hashish den. He uh, goes flying for the first time. He has his first love affair with a, an Egyptian tram conductor, Mohammed El Adel. So the big things are happening in his personal life but actually he finds possibly to his surprise that he's really good at the job of searching and what he does in this job is he goes to the hospitals of Alexandria of which there are many because Egypt 
is a sort of strategic supply base for Mesopotamia, um, um, Palestine, uh, the Dardanelles. The wounded from those campaigns are brought back to hospitals in Alexandria and Cairo. And when the wounded come back, Forster visits the hospitals, sits by the, ho the, be uh, the beds of these poor wounded men and interviews them about their um, missing colleagues to, to try and get any information that might lead to, you know, an identification of whether somebody's al uh, alive or dead. And he's really good at listening. Is that is that the, the trick? I mean, I was trying to think of... It's one of these old riddles. What do writers do in a time of war? Well, this seems to be a good job for them because they can go and, and be searchers. But there seems to be something beyond that in his personality which makes him very adept. Is he just, he's a good listener, is that it? Or has he got a kind of, uh, I don't know, an eye for detail as well? Uh, he has both of those things. But also he has or discovers he has a, a genuine uh, sympathy and empathy for the British soldier. I mean, I think that came as as a as a, a surprise to him. He he has ends up having a massive respect and affection for the British Tommy, and I think that that uh, is is one of the the, the aspects that, that that he finds fulfilling, and to a certain extent influences his uh, writing and certainly political positions after the war. Mm. Are we to imagine him as? Someone in uniform, or is would he be there in a more civilian capacity? What what was the official status of a searcher? Uh, technically, he was in military uniform. The Red Cross was at that stage sort of uh, had a military-ish hierarchy, and he would have worn uh, uniform. But I, it, it, I mean, the actual environment was not that military, and there was a he has a terrible moment in 1916 when it looks as if he may be forced to enlist. Uh, which he, he manages to get um, around that. Mm. But in 1915, if we bring this back to the November, I think you say, is this the moment of his arrival? That's the moment of his arrival in Alexandria, this sort of great um, cosmopolitan uh, port city in Egypt. Mm. Does he, when you were researching this particular story about Forster there, is, it, is there a a rich mine in the archives? Is it lots of letters or does he write about it more directly elsewhere? Um, there are letters. There are journals. The, the, the place I visited most, actually, for uh, the Forster correspondence was the um, library, the archives of King's College, Cambridge, where he was a fellow and where his, his papers are. And they have a wonderful collection of letters from this entire... Uh, period. So uh, that, that was very revealing, letters to his aunt, letters to his mother, letters to his, his Cambridge friends, which are quite detailed about what he gets up to in Alexandria. Are there any specific um, searches which have stayed in your mind from Forster's time there? Did he solve any problems? Did he, um, is there anything in particular that that you can remember. There was, there's obviously the example I mentioned earlier of the of the airman who he managed to locate to a hospital in Bombay. Forster specifically in one of his letters says that he never actually does what occasionally happens where a searcher confronts a person who's supposed to be dead and the person says, well, actually, that's me, you know. Uh, I, perhaps I should go and lie down now, one of them says. Well, there we go. That's a that's a nicer story than than often we have. Well, like, yeah, most of the sto stories are, you know, the, most of the stories, I'm afraid, end in in a phrase that actually Kipling coined in one of his short stories: "Missing always means killed." That's not true. Missing did not always mean killed, but missing often means killed. Well. Before we come back to 2021, we're almost in Remembrance Day now, but um, I'm going to give you the opportunity for a bit of material history. If you could bring back one tangible object from 1915 to remind you of this tour through the past today, what would you like to have? One of the most redolent, as it were, images from that era is probably an identity uh, disc, because actually these identity discs were often what determined whether you would be registered as dead or missing. And there are 
fewer of them around than there might be because they were, or well, two reasons. One is they were, were pretty biodegradable, which was not ideal. And the other was that the identity disc at that stage in 1915, the burial uh, crew would take the disc off the body and take the disc away. And that would therefore be the record that somebody had been dead. But the body would be buried, therefore, without an identity disc. And it was only the following year, 1916, that they had uh, they introduced a dual identity disc when one bit of it would be taken away to register the death and the other would be buried with the body to enable subsequent identification if if necessary. But I think the identity disc, which was a feature of the, a new feature of the First World War and actually goes to the heart of this whole subject of uh, retrieval, uh, identification and um, uh, commemoration is, is, is perhaps the one thing that's in a way not a particularly beautiful looking object but is the absolutely the most sort of poignant. Well it's a wonderful choice. I have to say the search is um, the quest for the lost of the First World War. I've been reading it over the last few days and it's a tremendously moving book. The Kipling story which lies at its heart is 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 very personal and, and poignant and um quite provoking as well. But you you also expand the story to tell us how the First World War broadly changed the way we think about the whole act of commemoration. I mean you say that um a hundred years before at the Battle of Waterloo people were just dumped into an unmarked grave. But then after the First World War things changed. I'd really recommend it to people who are considering thinking about this at this time of year but first of all I've got to say Robert Sackville West thank you very much for your time today I've really enjoyed talking to you I hope you've enjoyed it too yeah I've loved it thank you very much indeed that was me Peter Moore talking to Robert Sackville West about his new book The Searchers The Quest for the Lost of the First World War in one sense it's a book about a specific historical moment but in another the story transcends its period and really does tell us much more about the human spirit. I richly recommend it to you. We'll be bringing you another episode about the world wars later on in this Remembrance Week. Look out for that. But from me, for now, that's it. Thank you very much for listening.